So hear now the very word of God, as it is given to us in the Gospel of Luke, reading from the seventh chapter. Our focus is going to be on verses 39 through 47 this morning, but I'm going to go ahead and read the whole uh, story, 36 through 50, um, as we um, uh, continue to look at this beautiful scene that um, Luke has given us. One of the Pharisees asked, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm missing that, 36 is where we want it. yeah, 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. Behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him for she's a sinner. And Jesus answering him said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And may the Lord bless this reading of his word and our exposition of it this morning to his glory and our understanding. Let's ask him for that. Dear Lord, we... Thank you for the beautiful images that you give us in Scripture, and this is certainly one of those beautiful ones as we try to imagine the scene in our head, and then we try to do the impossible, which is to try to see things through your eyes, uh, see this woman and, and this Pharisee through the, the eyes of the Lord rather than our own eyes, and, and that we would see and get the message, the beautiful message that is here for each and every one of us, whether or not we're believers now or whether we are unbelievers, that we would understand the path that you are taking into the beautiful gospel, giving you all the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you could see what God sees, I know that's kind of a way hypothetical question, but if you could see what God sees... What do you think it would tell you about yourself? Do you think you might look at yourself differently? Most of us cannot even discern our own minds, much less our hearts, but God sees right through you. He sees into your heart. He sees your motivations. He sees your thoughts. He sees your intentions. If you could see yourself as God sees you, do you think it might change the way you look at yourself? If you could see what God sees. Do you think it might change the way you look at those who are around you, those who you have relationships with, those who are married, your husband or your wife, those who are parents, your children who seem so happy and innocent? If you could look into their hearts, what do you think you would find? What do you think you would find brewing in that rebellious teenager or your boss or, or your co-workers or the neighbors, the extended family, even your brothers and sisters here at New Hope? Uh, if you could look at their hearts and see what they're thinking and, and the intentions of their hearts, do you think it might change the way that you interacted with them? If you could see what God sees. Do you think it might change your priorities? 
Do you think that if you could see what was important to God and how different what is important to him might be from what is important to you, do you think that it might change the direction, what you give your energies to, what you focus on, what is important to you? If you could see what God sees, and this is the most important one, I think. If you could see what God sees, how might it change your opinion of Him, the way that you see Him? If, if, if you were seeing Him in the reality of who He is, in all of His infinite, and in His omniscience, in His omnipotence, in His holiness, if you could see Him rather than our humanizing of Him, which is what we so often do, do you think it might change the path of your life? How might you listen to what he says about himself? Now, I realize that these are moot points for the most part. <laughs> these are exercises in futility because we don't know the mind of God. In fact, we read that earlier, didn't we? God himself says that my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Higher than the heaven is above the earth are my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. So there's really no chance that we have to actually see things as God sees them. But one of the major parts of scripture is to reveal God to us is to reveal him in a way that he wants us to see him, in a way that we might know him better. But the problem that that creates is that quite often the God of Scripture is different than the God in our minds, the ones that we've watered down, the ones that we've put a boundary around, that we've made more compatible to our mind thoughts. And so, therefore, when that happens, it seems like everything is upside down. Take this story, for instance, that we have in front of us. This is an upside-down story. I mean, on the one hand, you have a woman who is so sinful, has such a history of sin, that her sinfulness is famous. Everyone in town knows that this woman is a sinful woman, and yet she is going to act in a way that Jesus is going to hold up to us as a model to follow, a model of virtue, something that God adores. Now, on the other hand, we have a Pharisee who was probably one of the most upstanding citizens in town. Everybody respected the Pharisees. They were righteous. They were pious. They did good things. They gave to the poor. I mean, these are the pillars of society, and yet... What we are going to see is that man is out of favor with God. Why? Because God looks on the inside, not on the outside. And so I know it's difficult for us. I, I, I know it's hard. But I do know at least to the degree that Scripture has revealed God to us. Even though we are finite, we are mortal, we are fallen. This morning we need to see this story through the eyes of God. The God that is revealed to us in Scripture. And hopefully by the end of this message, you will get the beautiful way that Jesus is presenting the gospel to us. Uh, I, I, I love what Brother Will said in our prayer. The elders pray before the, the message. And, 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 and he, he likened this to a diamond or the gospel to a diamond that has many facets. And, and you put it together, you've got the beauty of the, uh, of the gospel. But this is one facet of that gospel this morning that Jesus is going to share with us. Now, let's put it into its perspective, the perspective of Luke, the, where we are. We need to go back to the 29th and 30th verses. That, that's that sort of parenthetical thought that Luke interjected between the story of John the Baptist's disciples and Jesus' parable of the children in the marketplace. If you remember, I'm not going to read it, but in those two verses, um, Luke uh, says that, okay, according to the, the, the ministry of John the Baptist, he's making the 
transition from talking about John the Baptist to talking about Jesus. But he says that basically those who went out to see John responded in two different ways. One group, and it was a broad group, it was everyday people all the way to the hated tax collectors, but those who listened to his message were convicted by his message. They accomplished the purpose of God in John the Baptist because his purpose was to prepare a way for the Messiah who was coming. And through repentance and contrition, they would be baptized so that their hearts were ready for the grace that Jesus was bringing when he went to the cross. But the other group were the Pharisees and the lawyers, the same group in the sense that we're talking about now. And they rejected the purpose of God. That's an important phrase, rejected the purpose of God. Because the purpose of God was that there would be repentance that leads to forgiveness. Now, they rejected that wholeheartedly, and Jesus picked up on that, told the parable of children in the marketplace, if you remember. Children who didn't want to play funeral, didn't want to hear a dirge, didn't want to hear the, the, the wrath and fire that John the Baptist was preaching, but by the same token, they didn't want to hear a wedding march either. They didn't want to listen to Jesus and accept him as the Messiah. So they rejected the purpose of God. And that's the same group that we're going to be talking about this morning. Getting into their inner self where God sees. When we talked about that sort of the two-pronged nature of the gospel, that, that, that recognition of sinfulness that led to repentance and then the grace that God has given us through Jesus Christ and how essential both of those aspects of the gospel were, we talked about a third aspect of the gospel, which was that when someone is truly impacted by the gospel, by the full-orbed gospel, there is a recognizable, observable difference in their life. Well, that's the story of this woman. And, and the Pharisee doesn't get it, so he misses everything that the woman is doing. But she is the result. She's the example of the outflow of the full-orbed gospel. Now, if you're here last week, you know we started the story. And we focused on the woman. And what, uh, what I brought forth is a, a, an amazing act of worship. That she came to that place, as Dr. Sproul said, to go to church. She, she came to worship. But since that is the action of our entire discussion this morning, we need to go at, back at least to set that scene again. Now, Jesus has been invited to the house of a Pharisee. Make sure you remember that. He was invited. The Pharisee asked him to come to dinner. So there they are at the table, reclining at table. In those days, they would let the people in from the community to sit around the edges of the, the room to pay attention when a celebrity was invited. And so, so the room was probably full. The woman who we're talking about, the sinful woman, the woman of the city, had snuck in somehow um, and... And she was standing behind Jesus. And then when she recognized, when she became aware of her sinfulness, when she began to be mortified over those sins, but also when she joyfully realized at that point that those sins were forgiven and the one who was reclining at table before her was the forgiver of those sins, she couldn't contain it. And she burst into tears. She dropped to her knees, <laughs> raining tears down upon the dirty feet of Jesus. That's going to be important for our story. Waning down on his feet, turning those feet kind of muddy. And she sees that and she begins to wipe away the tears and the dirt with her hair, which she would have had to have taken down. That was provocative. That was considered indecent, if not immoral in those days. But yet, there was no sexual innuendo here. There's no eroticism. This is a pure act of love and worship on the woman's part because she begins to kiss his feet fervently and intensely like the prodigal son's father kissed the prodigal son. And then finally she anoints his feet. She had brought with her an alabaster flask of important, uh, uh, I mean not important, but expensive perfume and ointment. And she anointed the feet of Jesus. It was a beautiful, humble uh, 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 act of subjugation and worship and exaltation of Christ. Now, because the Pharisee doesn't get what has happened to the woman, he's watching this all the while. And that's where we come into our story 
for this morning. So let's take a look starting in the 39th verse and pick up the narrative from there. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this was who's touching him, for she is a sinner. Now, notice several things about this. First of all, notice that he thought to himself. He said to himself. Notice that this is not something that he spoke outwardly. He's not speaking to the woman. He's not speaking to Jesus. He's not speaking to the Pharisees who are at the table. He's thinking this in his mind. Jesus is going to discern his thoughts, which is the irony of this passage. Notice what he also does. He verifies for us. Jesus is going to verify it again a little bit later. But he verifies for us what we've already surmised. And that, that is that this woman is a famous sinner. Okay? She's well known by everyone in the community as a sinner, if not a professional sinner. She very well could be a prostitute, but she's not necessarily a prostitute. But she is a woman who has all of her life enjoyed sin, flaunted it and made a name for herself. And so this man sits back and he looks down his nose at Jesus and he says, well, obviously this man can't be a prophet because he doesn't know what kind of woman this is. Well, he's wrong on every single count there. First of all, he says, if this man's a prophet. Now, if we were studying, if we were reading through Luke's gospel, we would recognize something that we might have forgotten now because we're taking it bit by bit. And that is that what is on the table, the entire discussion, is not whether Jesus is a prophet or not. It is whether he is the son of God or not, whether he is the Messiah, whether he is God in the flesh. That's the discussion. So, so far away from that is this Pharisee that he doesn't even mention. Well, obviously, he's not the Messiah. He's saying he's not a prophet. Well, of course, Jesus is a prophet. But more than a prophet, he's also the Son of God. And that's what Luke is teaching us. So, notice how far out of the arena this Pharisee is. Secondly, notice that he makes a false assumption. He's assuming, he knows better than this, but he's assuming that if Jesus was a prophet, he would be omniscient. As if all prophets were omniscient, knows everything about everything. Now, of course, in his divine nature, Jesus does know. In his human nature, he doesn't know. Whether he knows about this woman or not is going to become very, very clear in a moment. He was well aware of his sinfulness. But he makes the assumption that because he's allowing the woman to, to, to touch his feet and to fondle him in public, that he obviously is not aware. So how on earth could he possibly be a prophet? But the third point that he's wrong on, and I've already mentioned it, is that Jesus is well aware that this woman is a sinner. Uh, he's, he's, he's more aware of her sin than any person on earth. Because Jesus is going to pay for every single one of her sins. Every single thing that that woman did wrong, he is going to suffer eternally for. And he is going to suffer the wrath of God on the cross for that woman's sin. And so Jesus knows more about sin. He knows more about your sin and my sin than anyone who has ever lived because he's the one who paid for those sins. And so therefore the Pharisee is absolutely wrong on every single account. But yet, there he is. And here's the irony of it. He, he's looking down his nose and he's passing judgment, not only on the woman, but on Jesus. And, and he brings out something that's quite human. Unfortunately, I think we all kind of do this. He's looking down his nose. And on the one hand, he's disgusted with what he sees. He's disgusted with this open, this sort of indecent display by this sinful woman. But at the same time, he's immensely satisfied with himself. Have you ever done that? You see somebody's life fall apart and you sit back and say, well, that's a terrible thing, but I told you so. I knew this was going to happen to them. I knew that they were going to go this way. So there's sort of a self-satisfaction in what you're seeing. But what you're seeing is something that could be tragic. Well, of course, in this sense, it is not tragic at all because Jesus knows exactly what's going on. So he's going to turn it around as he so often did and bring it right back to the Pharisee. Notice what he says in the 40th verse. And Jesus answering him said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered 
say it, teacher. Notice the words. Jesus answered him. The man didn't say anything. Okay? This is, he's thinking to himself. Luke doesn't give us any indication that there's any body language, that there's any murmuring, that there's any outward appearance of what the man is saying. And so here the man, this is the irony of the passage, by the way, because here the man is saying this guy's not a prophet because he doesn't know this woman's a sinner, and Jesus is discerning his thoughts all the while because Jesus knows exactly what's going on. You see, we're going to get a window into Simon here. We're going to get a window to be able to see this Pharisee as God sees him. Not as the rest of the people at the table. And don't fool yourself, brothers and sisters. If you were at that table invited to the same dinner, you'd probably be championing Simon and not the woman. You'd be just as disgusted at what she was doing because you wouldn't have understood it until Jesus made it clear. Well, anyway, um, he says that he, he, he turns to Simon. By the way, let me go ahead and say this about Simon. Let me dispel a common misconception here. There's another story that's very similar to this in the other Gospels um, at a man named Simon's house. Now, the skeptical scholars would love you to believe that, well, this was all just kind of made up, and so the details change as they make it up. But no, they're two different stories, very similar, but different meanings because they're at different times. Later on in Matthew and Mark, literally the week of his passion, Jesus is going to be in the house of a Simon the leper in Bethany down in Judea, long way from where he is now much later in his ministry. So don't think that even though Mary, the sister of Lazarus, is going to break an alabaster bottle of nard and anoint his feet in that same kind of a situation, but a whole different focus, that's not the same event. We're in Galilee. We're at a Pharisee's house named Simon. Many people were named Simon in these days. Obviously, Simon Peter, that was his name. So um, let's not confuse the two. But anyway, Jesus calls him out. He says, Simon, I, I, I have something I need to talk to you about. Now, notice Simon's response. Let's put him in his right perspective. He says, say it, teacher. Now, some commentators will look at that and they will say, well, that's just a cold politeness because teachers were well respected. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't see that. I, I, I see this as arrogant and biting. The way, I mean, look at the rest of the story. Later on, when we see the way he as a host has treated Jesus and what's going on in his head, thinking you're no prophet, you're a false prophet, and that's actually the reason that I invited you here is to, to bring this. He could not be more satisfied that this woman was making a spectacle of, over Jesus' feet. And so therefore, what he actually says is, speak on, teach. <laughs> Get yourself out of this one. I, I, I can't wait to hear what you're going to say to exonerate yourself because I've got you. You know, If you knew who this woman was, there's no way you'd let her be doing that to your feet. And boy, was Jesus a master at turning things around, turning them on their heads, and the way he did it was to reveal what's going on in the mind of God. And that's the way he goes on when he continues this. And the way he does it, as he often did, is just simply to launch into a parable. This is probably one of the simplest parables that Jesus taught. Look in the 41st verse. A certain money lender, that's important, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. That's probably the simplest of the parables Jesus taught. It almost defies any commentary, but you know I'm a preacher. I've got to say something about it. So we have two debtors here. We've got one who owes 50 denarii and one that owes 500. Most of you know that a denarii is just a denomination of money back then. It was the amount that a day laborer would usually make for a day's work. It's the amount that they paid a Roman soldier for a day's work. So just take whatever you make, take home in a day, what you would calculate, and that's basically what a denarii was. Now... One of them owed 50 denarii. That's about two months' wages, considering a six-month, or I'm sorry, a six-day work week. 50 denarii, that's 
pretty good amount, but the other one owed 500 denarii. That's 20 months, one in three quarters years almost. That's a lot of money. Now, the focus here is on the difference between the two. You know, when God looks at this, from God's perspective, and he looks at 500 denarii and 50 denarii, there's all pittance as far as he's concerned, he owns the universe. But the focus of this parable, and we want to stay true to it, is that the one owed 10 times the amount of the other, and yet the money lender forgave both of them the exact same amount. Both of those men are going to walk out of that, that freeing absolutely free. Now, there's a couple of things that I want you to notice. First of all, he's a money lender. So he does this at great risk to himself. Can you imagine if you're a money lender and you owe the bank anything? What, what if you heard the bank says that they're do, giving grace and actually letting you not pay off what you owe? Well, you go out of business in a hurry. Banks can't do that. They're in the business to lend money and to get money back. So if anyone hears that this man is absolving the debts like this, then they're not going to pay their bills. So he does it at great risk to himself. But the second thing I want you to see is that this is absolute unmitigated grace. There was no discussion. They didn't do anything. There was no begging. There was no discussion of whether or not there was a mitigating circumstance. All we hear is that the money lender forgave the debts and the debt is done. And both of these men are debt free. So Jesus turns to Simon and he asks the poignant question. Which one of these would love him more? Don't miss what Jesus says. I mean, sometimes we read over this. We don't pay attention. Notice how he has drawn the path from forgiveness to love. Notice that. Notice that that's not necessarily what we would say. In other words, you might say one was more thankful than the other. One was more relieved than the other. One was more um, um, happy than the other. But where does love come in? But that's the way that Jesus leads us in the question. He's leading us down a path. That path is going to end up in the gospel, okay? This is one facet of the gospel. And so he says, of those who were forgiven, which one loves more? Well, notice the response of Simon. It's kind of a sad, isn't it? In verse 43, Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom you can he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Notice that Simon cannot even bring himself to admit that Jesus is right and backed him into a corner and turned the whole thing around. Oh, I suppose. You know, remember, there's a whole table there. And so they're all paying attention. And so, okay, now where they were looking at Jesus and saying, how are you going to get yourself out of this one? Now they're looking at Simon and saying, how are you going to get yourself out of this one? Well, I suppose, you know, let's move on to the next thing. I suppose it would be the latter one. Can't even bring himself to admit it. But then notice what Jesus says next. You have judged rightly. In other words, you, 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 you've made the right assessment and I know that I'm reading something into the text here, but I cannot help but think that this is the evangelist in Jesus coming out. He evangelized the Pharisees just like he evangelized the woman caught in adultery or this particular woman who is sinful. And so he says, Simon, you know this. You know this. You know the scriptures. You know how important love is to God. And you know that you cannot achieve holiness on your own. So what on earth are you doing trying to redeem yourself? You've judged rightly. You know this. So how come you can't put two and two together and understand that there's no way that your righteousness is going to stand before a holy God? Once again, we're seeing things through God's eyes. And not through our own. Well, Jesus not only um, is, I think, reaching out, but he, he, boy, I tell you what, he has set him up. He has set him up for a lesson that we'll bring out later on. But he's going to go right back to what we saw the woman do. And, and we saw the woman as an act of love and adoration and exaltation and contrition and an act of worship. 
Now what Jesus is going to do is he's going to compare the way that Simon, the, the one that the rest of the world thinks is such a good man, I'm going to compare the way you have treated me, the Son of God, the way that you have treated me in comparison to the way this woman is treating me. Now, through God's eyes, which one of these do you think is going to be favored? And brothers and sisters and friends, don't disassociate yourself from this. You know, we're talking about a Pharisee. But every single person on earth, that's what that story of the children, it was this generation. Every single person who in any way thinks that they can redeem themselves without the cross work of Jesus Christ. Jesus is talking straight to you. And he goes back and he lists all three of those. And since we've already dealt with the woman uh, more uh, extensively. I'm going to talk about what the woman did first, and then we'll talk about um, what the Pharisee did or what Simon did. Turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Boy, I love that. Okay, Simon, stop looking at me. I want you to look at this woman. I want you to see her. You think it disgusts you. I want you to see what she is doing, not through your eyes, but through God's eyes. I want you to see the way he sees the act of worship that she is involved with. He goes on and he says, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Now, we've already gone over the, the act of humility, the act of subjugation that the woman is doing as she, as she cries and weeps over with joy and contrition over her sins being forgiven and the one who has forgiven those sins. We, we've talked about that, but notice how he turns that on the Pharisee. Notice what he says, when I entered your house. Boy, that, that, that puts the whole thing in perspective because... You see, it was a common courtesy that anyone who entered your house, you gave them water for their feet. Usually, for people like Simon, who more than likely had servants, if he can put on a big dinner like this, it would be the lowliest servant in the house who would meet you as you came in. Remember, we've talked about the dusty streets and all the animals out there and the fact that you didn't want those kind of feet in your house. And so therefore, they would meet you at the door and wash your feet so that you would enter the house cleansed. Now, just try to imagine, just try to visualize this scene. Because there's a big table there. And there's Pharisees and people from town all around that table. Do you really think that one single one of those people entered the house without the common courtesy of having their feet washed? And yet Jesus has dirty feet. What does that tell you? That tells you that he denied a common courtesy to Jesus that he offered to everyone else. That Jesus' feet are dirty because he didn't even offer him a bowl of water. This is not worship, folks. It's not what the woman was doing, which is weeping over his feet and showing tremendous love. This is an act of non-worship. This is a slap in the face. This is an insult. This is a message that I don't need you, and I don't appreciate who you are, and I think you're a false prophet, and you're not even worth having your feet cleaned. People wonder why God gets upset at people who reject his son. Well, he goes on and he says about the second one, you gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. What a scene that is. That verifies what we said last week, that this was more than just a peck. Okay, she's, she's kissing his feet over and over again. By the way, it, it brings sort of a new perspective it almost sounds in the way that Jesus says this. I always envision Jesus walking in, being at table, and the woman sneaking in. But it sounds like it's actually the other way around. The woman must have been in there early in the darkness waiting for Jesus to get there. And when Jesus gets there, he, she attacks him. You know? Well, I, 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 I doubt that that's the way it was. But nonetheless, it almost sounds like uh, that she came in. I, I mean, when Jesus came in, she immediately started kissing his feet. A sign of adoration and love exactly the opposite with pharisee it's it's completely traditional that if you invite remember i said pay attention to that the pharisee invited jesus 
When you invite a celebrity, a prophet, to your home, that the host meets them at the front door after the servant cleans their feet and greets them with a kiss. Uh, 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 just a friendly kiss, you know. Uh, in a lot of cultures, they still do that. Many of you, when you get together with your family, you'll give each other a, a, a kiss on the cheek. When we go to Haiti, we, we see that quite often. There's sort of a half hug and sort of a, not really a kiss on the cheek, it's sort of a touching the cheek with kiss in the air near the cheek, you know. Um, but, it, it, you know, it's still a, a, a kiss. And, and in fact, both Paul and Peter say that that's the way that Christians used to greet each each other with a holy kiss. And, and that's the kind of kissing that she's doing. But even the common courtesy, the honor, the, 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 the normal friendship that would be extended to someone who you invited to your house as sort of the guest of honor, he failed to do purposely. That's not an act of friendship. That's an act of disdain. Look how different it is from what the woman is doing. This is an act of disdain from the Pharisee to Jesus. And finally, he says this about the ointment. He says, you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Perfume. And in fact, there's an object lesson for everyone when Jesus says this, because if this is the same kind of perfume that I think it is, well, it's permeated the room. It is like a cloud hanging over everybody because it's very pungent, okay? Now, I'm also told that when you invite a special person to your house, you would meet them at the door, make sure that their feet are washed, kiss them on the cheek, and then you would anoint their head with olive oil. That was just common courtesy when you wanted to honor a guest. Remember, they used to anoint the kings and the prophets and the priests, and apparently, if you were a special invited guest, but Simon just failed to do that. But once again, I think part of the focus here is on the value of the two. Remember, we're talking about 550 denarii. We're talking about the worth of the Pharisees' actions and the worth of the woman's actions. Well, here we have a couple of pennies worth of olive oil that he failed to do and a hugely expensive bottle of perfume. If it's anything like the pure nard that Mary, the sister of Lazarus, used, remember, Judas got upset at that, didn't he? He said that could have been sold for 300 denarii. That's a year's wages that she has just testified to the whole room. This is what I think about him. This is how I honor him. This is how I exalt him. And the Pharisee didn't even put a couple of pennies worth of olive oil on his head. Now, if you put all these together, it looks to me that what the Pharisee has done has purposely slighted Jesus, that he has invited him to his house to insult him. He has invited him to his house to make a point very clear. I'm righteous, you're not. I'm redeemed, and you're a false prophet. I don't need you for salvation. And oh, is that the comparison? Because on the one hand, we have the self-righteous, self-redeemed, and on the other hand, we have the one who is poor in spirit, broken, who recognizes above all things that she needs Jesus. That's the distinction I want you to see. Jesus makes that clear as he goes on. He says, therefore, well, what does that tell you? It tells you that this is a sort of the conclusion. He's told the, uh, the, the parable, he's made the application, and now he concludes it. Therefore, I tell you, that's Luke's sort of modified truth formula. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. I, I love the ESV translation, <clears throat> although sometimes I disagree with the way it's translated and this is one of them, I think it gives you the wrong impression. Let me make sure that you get the right impression from this. Um, when, when he says, uh, her sins are many, and they have been, or they are forgiven, that makes it sound like it's something that Jesus is doing right then and there. But that's not the verb. The New American Standard has it correctly. It says, her sins have been 
are given. It's in a perfect tense. And when you have a perfect tense, it means something that has been done or completed in the past. This particular grammar of this word is something that was completed in the past but still is impacting the present. So in other words, that verifies for us that when the woman came, she came to church. She came to worship. She brought the alabaster flask to anoint Jesus out of love that she had because she knew she was forgiven. So here's the important point, and let me give it to you in a principle because it is that vital. She was not forgiven because she loved first. She loved because she was forgiven. Let me make sure you understand that. She was not forgiven because she loved Jesus. She loved because she was forgiven. The forgiveness comes first, brothers and sisters, and that's the very core of what this is all about. And that is exactly what the Pharisee has missed. He, he thinks that by what he does or what he accomplishes or the rules that he does, he can express his love for God and he interprets that as love for God. But he has not been forgiven. <laughs> now, I think that this is kind of an aside, but I think that when Jesus says that he who has forgiven little loves little, I think that with Simon, it's like he who doesn't love at all has not been forgiven at all. Why would Simon not be forgiven? Why is the woman forgiven and Simon is not forgiven? Again, I want to stay on the, the narrow path that Jesus is giving us, one facet of this gospel. I don't want to branch out. What he is talking about is how does love for God come about? True love for God. Well, it comes about by those who are first forgiven, which has not happened with the Pharisee. Why has it not happened with the Pharisee? Well, let's go back. Let's go back to that 30th verse. Because the Pharisee has rejected the purpose of God that was accomplished through the ministry of John the Baptist. What was John the Baptist's ministry? It was to prepare the hearts for the coming of the Lord. He preached a gospel of repentance and forgiveness. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, you must repent, and I'm preparing the heart for those who are going, for the one who is going to come to save you. A heart that is ready for the gospel, a heart that is ready for the grace of God is a heart that has repented and has mortification over its sin. And then you're ready for the grace of God and the unspeakable grace of God that comes through Jesus Christ. This whole discussion of of forgiveness goes back even farther than that. Remember the story of the paralytic when they lowered him down through the roof? Remember that Jesus didn't say, hey, listen, pick up your bed and walk and go home. You're healed. He said, your sins are forgiven. And they got mad at him. Okay, here's a man that is doing miracles that only God can do. There's no way that somebody who's born a paralytic or was absolutely incapable of, of getting up could ever do that unless God was part of it. And Jesus says, I am sent by God and your sins are forgiven because I have the right to forgive sins. And they say, wait a minute, only God can forgive sins. And Jesus said, and? <laughs> well, okay, I got you. So what's the problem? But what did they do? They called him a blasphemer rather than to accept him for who he was as the son of God. And so right now we see the same thing happen. These are the children in the marketplace. These are the ones who said, no, I've got a tune that I want you to play. And unless you play my tune, I'm not going to dance. I'm not going to dance uh, to John the Baptist and I'm not going to dance to Jesus. I am self-redeemed. So why was the Pharisee unforgiven? He's unforgiven because he has no sin awareness. Oh my goodness, how important this is. How vital this is to the gospel. The woman had sin awareness. She knew she was a sinner. She admitted it. She embraced it. She recognized that her sin would condemn her. And so therefore, when Jesus says, you are forgiven, later on he says, your faith will, will, has saved you. We'll get to faith next week. 
But when her sins are forgiven, she cannot control herself. The joy of the fact that her sins are so many, she just flows into love. But that love that she's experiencing, brothers and sisters, is the outflow of the full-orbed gospel. She's a changed woman. She has been forgiven first because she turned to Jesus Christ. And because she's forgiven, she is able to love him with a complete and total and a sincere love. The Pharisee is not forgiven. Why? Because he is not sin aware. He doesn't want to talk about his sin. He looks down his nose at everybody else. And he says, I am the one who is the religious leader of the day. And again, remember that Jesus said this is a generation of people, not just the people who lived then. It's anyone who thinks that in any way that they can redeem themselves, who thinks in any way that they are able to stand in the presence of a holy God on their own righteousness. Even men like this who know what the Old Testament says about the holiness of God. So if you could see through God's eyes, what do you think God would say to this Pharisee? If you could see through God's eye, and once again, don't disassociate yourself from this Pharisee. If you think that salvation is not important, if you think that you're just simply going to walk into the presence of God, then Jesus is talking directly to you. If you could hear God speak, which by the way, you just have, not through me, but through the word. But if you could see how God would respond to this, how do you think he would respond to to Simon? He would say, Simon, do you in your wildest imagination actually believe that your righteousness is anything but filthy rags before me? Do you honestly believe that you can attain the level of righteousness to stand in the presence of my holiness? You can't. But I know that you can't. So I sent my son to save you, and that's him right in front of you. The one that you failed to even offer water to wash his feet. The one that you have disdained. The one that you not only don't love and haven't exalted, but the one that you are belittling and rejecting completely and totally. You have not worshipped him. You have not given him glory. You have not exalted him. And so therefore you have rejected my plan to save you the only way that you are ever going to be saved. And so therefore, because you reject my plan of salvation, there's nothing else I can do except send you to hell. And when I do so, the human world will cry out and say, foul, unfair. God can't send anyone to hell. Look at this man. He was so faithful. He was so pious. He did all the offerings and did everything that he was supposed to do. He went to church every single Sunday. And yet you're saying that when he stands before you at the end of the time, you're going to, and says, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all these things for you? He's going to say, depart from me. You worker of iniquity. Cast him out into the outer darkness. And for that, you think God is unfair. Not if you're looking through his eyes, folks. Not if you're looking through the eyes of God. If you're looking through the eyes of God, you're going to see this entirely differently. If you look through the eyes of God, you're going to recognize two things. You're going to recognize a whole bunch of things. But let me just focus on two things. One, you're going to recognize that sin is a big deal to God. Your sin is a big problem. Now, I know that when I say that, I brand myself. I know that. I recognize it. I realize that people say, well, you're a negative preacher. You only talk about sin and negativity. I don't come to church to hear all that kind of stuff. I want to hear positive things. And and you're nothing but hellfire and brimstone. Well, so was John the Baptist, so I don't feel too bad about it. But sin is a big problem with God. Your sin is a major problem. He is holier than to look upon your defilement. He cannot abide it. And your own attempts at righteousness don't cut it. God is not impressed, my dear friend, 
with your self-righteous, self-redeeming, autonomous, that means auto-law-keeping, you make it up yourself, your arrogant religiosity. He's not impressed. It's not going to save you. You'll never stand before him with that, ever. You need to be more like this woman who is lost and knows it and knows her sins condemn her and goes and runs to Jesus and falls upon his feet and weeps with joy and contrition because of those sins. Sin's a big deal. Something's got to happen to your sin, folks. Something has to deal with it. You can't wish it away. You can't rationalize it away. You can't just simply go to churches where they don't talk about sin. You have to deal with it in some way. Of course, the way that you deal with it is through Jesus Christ. The second thing, if you could see through God's eyes, you would understand how important love is to him. Brother Will read it earlier from Deuteronomy. That's the Shema. That is recited by good Jews every day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Jesus says that's the greatest commandment. And that along with love your neighbor as yourself, all the commandments hang on that. The most important thing to God is that you love him. But if I understand this passage, there's a process to getting to love God. You don't just walk out and say, okay, God, I love you. <laughs> the Pharisee did that. Oh, he, you ask him, do you love God? He would have said, absolutely, I love God. I, I, I quote the Shema to you. But if I read this passage correctly, one aspect of the gospel that Jesus is leading us to is that it's forgiveness that leads to love. Those who are forgiven much love much. And if you're sin aware, if you recognize how egregious your sins are before a holy God, then you are devastated over those sins. And when you're forgiven from those sins, you love a great deal. Love comes from forgiveness. The true love of God comes when God forgives you. And then that forgiveness is a result of repentance and mortification over the sins. And forgiveness turns into righteousness that Jesus won for you on the cross. Righteousness of the atonement of the cross, salvation, and redemption before God for an eternity. That's the process. So if you really want to truly love God, are you forgiven? And how do you get forgiven? Well, first of all, you've got to recognize you need forgiveness. If you do not recognize you need forgiveness like the Pharisees did, you will never be forgiven because you will never run to Jesus and say, I need you. And so therefore, if you could see through God's eyes, and let me just leave you with this. If you could see through God's eyes, why would this woman's work, why would it be so absolutely vital to him why would love be so greatly important? And why would the worship that she was doing be so great? What would God say to this woman? Or let me put it a different way. What would he say to you? Imagine that you are here by yourself and there's no one else here but Jesus. Just you and Jesus, just the two of you. And you have a one-on-one -on -one with him. What do you think that his instructions would be from this gospel that we just read? What do you think he would say to you? Well, I think that what he would say would be to reach out his hand to you and say, child, don't you understand that God knows in his omniscience that you can't possibly live up to the standards that he set for you? That God knows that he's holy and perfect and that therefore he sent me to be your savior. And that if you put your trust in me, if you believe in me with all of your heart, every fiber, if you step out and stop believing in yourself, stop redeeming yourself and recognize that your sins will condemn you and you have one path to salvation. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is one path to salvation and that is through Jesus Christ. If you would simply put yourself in my hands, I will save you. And if you realize that, what would you do? 
How would you respond if you were truly aware of all your sins and they weighed down upon you like Christian's backpack that he couldn't get rid of? And your sins were oppressing you. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. They're wiped away. What might you do? What do you think you would do if it was just you and Jesus? Well, you might fall at his feet first. You might weep uncontrollably because you could see the destination that you were just saved for and how unworthy you are of that salvation. You might... Humble yourself before him. You might subjugate yourself to him as the king and the Lord of your life. You might overflow with love towards him. There might be an adoration and an intense desire to express that love. And you might exalt him. You might glorify him. You might have a need to praise him and to worship. Wait a minute. That's just what that woman did, isn't it? That's just what she did. And that's the message, folks. That the one who's forgiven much, and, 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 and if you think that you're not forgiven much, you're just not looking at it through God's eyes. But the one who's been forgiven much, I mean, the one who loves much, is the loving because you've been forgiven much. That's the story. And Jesus cries out to you and says, Turn to me, turn to me and be forgiven. Turn to me and be loved. Turn to me and be redeemed. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you that you give us such beautiful, beautiful pictures uh, in, in your gospel. And uh, as I said earlier, what a beautiful analogy it is. This is a facet. This is one path into the gospel. It speaks of the, the love that we are to have for you and the fact that that love flows from your redemption, your forgiveness of us. And, and, and what an example this woman is from, from the, the wrong side of town, the wrong kind of woman, completely lost in her sins. But she knows it and why is it that we don't, that we think that we are righteous enough, like the Pharisee, that uh, we'll escape your wrath, but we know that we won't, and we thank you for the times that you tell us, and I pray that those who need to hear this, and it needs to take hold in their heart, I pray that you would, through your spirit, make it real. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.